webinar will be recorded and made available on this demand meeting after is the being live recorded. session. We will provide you with some of those details at the end. Also, we'd love to hear from you during today's presentation. If you have a question for our speaker, please feel free to send it through the Q&A panel where we'll be ready to respond. If you experience any audio issues, please use the call-in number displayed on the chat screen. I will post that once again momentarily. So without further ado, I'd like to think, kick things off by welcoming Greg. Greg, right over to you. Thanks, Jenner. Uh, thanks for joining everybody today. Uh, we are going to talk about stopping brand impersonation uh, in the Cisco Secure email stack. Uh, you know, this thing that's pretty, pretty top of mind, obviously, um, you know, when it comes to email security, it still is the number one threat vector. We see lots of different threats, whether that's, you know, identity impersonation or brand impersonation, specifically that we're actually talking about here. Um, uh, we're discussing, you know, relatively nasty attacks such as business email compromise, right, is a common tactic. Um, you know, one of those things I'm sure you've probably seen, probably uh, the uh, number one phishing attempt seems like that I ever see is somebody sending an, an email from Microsoft support, um, you know, trying to evade all of the URL engines and maybe the Im image engines. Uh, things like that. And those are things that are actually coming into email threat defense. So that's why I actually wanted to start with that. Uh, brand impersonation is something we already track within email threat defense. If you're an existing Cisco secure email customer and you're on an ESA or CES, uh, one of the things I will actually point out for Cloud Gateway, this is something that is already released um, that you could actually have a connector from your cloud email security environment into the email threat defense environment. Uh, for now, only Office 365 customers uh, are supported. It is uh, on our roadmap and we've definitely heard from our customers that uh, you know we need to be able to support things outside of Office 365 uh, and hoping our next major release will, um, will assuredly support uh, those users that are using on-premise Exchange or G Suite. Now that is going to be supported um, through that same connector um, from your uh, CES environment. But in our, in our next release, we're hoping to get it to uh, deploy if you have on-premise gateways as well, and you actually want to transfer that uh, into your email threat defense environment, you can go ahead and do that. And there's a simple deployment to do that. Just go into security services. Threat connector, um, and it'll actually give you something that looks like a mail uh, mail address, so you could actually go ahead and configure that. And that's specifically for you know our customers who who are our gateway customers, and they're they're wanting to look at getting into email threat defense. Um, you know, I definitely talked about these um, in our monthly webinars before. Uh, certainly, if you want to reach out to us and see a demo of email threat defense. More than happy to do that as well. Um, you can you can get a free trial uh, even on the Cisco.com website. So, you know, if you haven't heard this before, what are we doing in email threat defense? Well, we're trying to mitigate business risks. You can actually see the business risks on convicted emails in email threat defense. Uh, and we're getting natural language processing. So here's one, one of the first ways um, that we can actually detect you know, that brand impersonation is we are going through and we're reading that whole message, right? And we have over 80 different algorithms within the email threat defense platform. Go ahead and uh, look at various things. Now, obviously, um, brand impersonation, uh, cousin domains, et cetera, those things that you want to call out are one of the algorithms that we actually do have on in, in email threat, threat defense. Uh, another thing that we do track in email threat defense is various threat techniques, right? So if there's an open redirect or some other way that they're they're attempting to obfuscate where they're truly coming from or where, you know, you're perceiving that link to go. Uh, these are things we should actually be able to ca uh, catch in email threat defense. Um, obviously, we do have URL protection in and of itself within the secure email gateway, whether you're actually using the ESA or you're using CES. We, um, and if you are actually running an older version of code for ESA, uh, that is something that I would actually suggest, uh, as always, to try and get to the latest major revision, uh, because we have looked at ways of refactoring how we handle URLs within the email security appliance. 
Uh, you know, one of our newer updates, if you haven't upgraded in a while, uh, within the past year would be th the ability to uh, claw back URLs, right? Um, just as we have had it for file-based attacks for a while, uh, we're going to track the URLs that actually came through and do a post remediation on your environment. Now, that's for the gateway for email threat defense. Uh, we do innately, because of the, the tight integration that it currently has existing for Office 365 for all of our customers, right? Uh, it will go back in time after it crawls the URL uh, to pull those back. So that functionality is natively in email threat defense. Uh, it's going to be, we will have uh, more updates uh, once email threat defense uh, is deployed in a manner that is where you don't have that tighter integration for Office 365. Uh, certainly that will be something that we'll cover in a webinar at a later date uh, when those features are available. But the real thing here is we want to be able to layer in those detections, right, for machine learning. Um, I talked about brand impersonation, but individual uh, name imposters, and maybe we're at, you know, victim specific URLs. These are all things, again, um, where we're building out that relational database um, to, uh, to, to see, right, who has sent who email. Um, and again, the algorithms we can actually do uh, by creating that localized database just for your environment. Uh, so we know, you know, who, who's frequently communicating with you, what time of day do they usually communicate with you, right? These are all things that we can map uh, and we can do machine learning via that threat connector, via uh, email threat defense. So um, if you haven't seen it, again, this is, you know, just an example screenshot of, you know, what the kind of techniques we can actually call out. The one thing I'll say, if you're in a live production environment, uh, it will give you more than just the standard text that you actually see here, right? If it was a malicious file, it would actually give you the SHA. If it was um, the URL, it would actually give you the specific URL um, that was what was tagged here. Um, and, and the same thing where, you know, the message segment, it'll, it'll actually give you um, the little uh, sentence that the ag algorithm tied on, right? If there was a search, uh, a call to action or a sense of urgency, Right. Um, if a request for money, it'll tell you what that was. And when we actually look at the threat categorizations, risks and techniques, if you haven't seen that before, uh, they are color coded um, for the riskiest techniques uh, to pop up or bubble up uh, in front of you. But we do have some simpler concepts when we're talking um, about how we actually stop brand impersonation. And uh, that's the sender authentication trifecta. If you're not familiar with it, we do offer a couple of different options um, for setting up DMARC, and I'll dig into a little bit more about what DMARC is uh, a little later on. But if you are a CES or an ESA customer, right, you can set this uh, via policy and configuration uh, to tag things um, that are that have failed DMARC or failed DCAM or failed failed SPF, right. Um, and how those works. I mean, I think DMARC is getting to be more and more of a standard um, in industry, right? Um, certainly for, for SPF, from a Microsoft point of view, they'll, they'll certainly tell you um, what mail servers should be sending uh, on their behalf. Uh, and again, at a high level, SPF, Center Policy Framework, that's the idea that we're going to publish a DNS text record uh, to tell you which uh, mail servers are authorized to send mail on our behalf. DCAM is when we're signing uh, that mail and sending it out the door, uh, that it truly uh, was a message from our server um, and we'll publish the, you know, a public key along line that so you know that it wasn't modified in transit. Now, there are some limitations to DMARC uh, that depending on how aggressive you actually want to get, uh, from a DMARC point of view and, and stopping that mail, right? If if a sender, a well-known sender for you, um, they may have a, a complex infrastructure in place, or maybe that they don't have uh, DMARC configured uh, correctly, you could get failures, right? If it went through a mailing list or some other alteration, uh, DMARC is going to fail. But DMARC is a good way uh, as a kind of step one 
for event, uh, preventing brand abuse, right? Um, it's been around since 2012, uh, so over a decade now. Uh, it, we're getting further um, and further adoption as you see companies out there uh, publishing their their DMARC record, right? Um, and I think top of mind for all of us, at least within the security background, is to give you security. But there are some additional uh, benefits to actually setting up a valid DMARC record, and that's the other side of that security uh, coin, right? If I go ahead from a, a security point of view and uh, I'm blocking all of your mail that is uh, not DMARC aligned, right? Your mail is not getting delivered. Um, so, you know, that is core to, to marketing people, right? Um, if you're actually, you know, spending all of that money to have millions of emails delivered, uh, you want to you want to have good assurances that you're getting uh, good value for the money that you're actually sending. It also can give us visibility uh, into who's uh, spoofing our domain, right? Um, we get those RUA um, and RUFs. I'll get back to that a little bit later, but basically you're getting information back um, about, you know, again, who's sending mail on your behalf um, and they can actually track that via the SPF in DCAM. So SPF, sender policy framework, I touched on this already a little bit. It's used to authenticate the sender of an email. And how is that? Uh, how does that happen? An SPF record, is, it's a, just a DNS text record that contains a list of IPs that are allowed to send email on my behalf, right? Um, if you're using one of the big web stores, again, the, they'll do this on, on your behalf, right? Uh, they will send, they will, uh, obviously state all of the IPs that are valid IPs um, for, again, let's say the Microsoft infrastructure to send out of, but we can do the same, um, we can get you the same place, obviously using tools. If you're using a, an email gateway via us, DKIM, that is actually configured uh, within the ESA uh, for you to actually sign, sign your mail, right? And then you have the course signing um, DNS text record with the public key so uh, they know that your digitally signed message uh, coming from your domain was not uh, modified in transit. So those are pretty much the building blocks uh, for DMARC, right? It's SPF, it's, uh, it's that text record or that DNS text record of uh, you know a mail server that is authorized to send mail on your behalf, and we have our DKIM, which is you know where we're going to digitally sign our mail. That gets a little bit complicated on how you actually go ahead and sign your messages. This is a pretty high level, um, but um, at the end of the day, right, we should be able to do a valid lookup on whether. Um, that message truly was sent from the mail server it was claiming to be and that uh, the mail was not modified in process right so it gives you that control um, to set policy that, that you want obviously um, you know when you're publishing your record uh, you can set it from a dmark point of view to monitor quarantine or reject and the same, you can set that as a sender to, to tell receivers what actions they should take. Um, as from a receiving point of view, we do get very granular within uh, the secure email security or Cisco secure email security appliance. Uh, you can set gateway policy for how you will actually handle failures of different outcomes, right? Uh, you know, whether they, they have set themselves to monitor quarantine or reject, right? Just because they have it uh, set as reject, likely you should reject it, um, but maybe for whatever reason, uh, you wanna have a different policy for it. Maybe you actually wanna quarantine it, um, or maybe you actually wanna do different handling uh, with a content filter action, right? To log those entries to see uh, what actually happened on your gateway. So just like SPF and DKIM, right, your DMARC, your DMARC policy is also, it's, a, it's an additional text record 
uh, involved with your DNS, right? And this is what uh, your DMARC record looks like, right? Um, the first part just states that it's a, a it's a, a DMARC record. Uh, P equal to none. That equal that part is you know whether you're actually none would mean you're suggesting no enforcement. If you were, you could set it to uh, quarantine, or you could actually set it to reject. Uh, that's where that at is at. Uh, the RUA and the RUF, um, those are for the reject records, right? Um, and it's going to aggregate all of, of that messaging. Forensics is where or the RUF will give you detailed uh, about what specific messages were actually rejected. Um, and then obviously you have the email address uh, to send uh, those reporting to you. And that's pretty much your, your DMARC record policy. Now, it looks relatively simple. And right here, obviously, we can get it in one line as an example. Um, but, you know, this is definitely a problem that scales when you're discussing DMARC. Uh, and some companies definitely can have hundreds or even thousands of domains um, that they are administrating. Right. As I uh, said on DMARC policy, right, uh, we have the, you know, the following options. Monitoring uh, equals no impact on the mail flow. But the advantage of actually setting a valid DMARC record and setting it to P equals none will be the fact um, that you will actually start to get messages. Um, and that's going to be starting point for any journey that you're going to, to have when you're actually creating a DMARC policy. Um, a lot of companies have no idea who is sending mail on their behalf, um, depending on the structure of your organization, right? It could be um, very collaborative or, you know, different organizations, or different business units may be able to send mail on their own behalf. Uh, maybe they, they've signed third-party contracts with different mail services, right? Um, maybe they're, they've signed a contract for marketing and a contract for recruiting, right? There can be lots, uh, lots and lots of different ways uh, that mail is getting sent beha on behalf of your company. Um, and if you actually start to implement a DMARC record that is overly aggressive before you really get an understanding of what was going on in your environment, um, that's going to cause problems for you. So uh, once you get to the point uh, where you're up and running and you can get, let's say, a P equals quarantine, you're a few months into your project uh, and you're feeling pretty good about it. You know, obviously, uh, the, the the level of effort is going to be less uh, to, ma to maintain once you get uh, into a good posture. And uh, the final step, uh, once you're feeling really good, uh, and you're looking at your reports and you're convinced um, that, hey, really, um, all of these messages from all this reporting, um, you know, you really should reject uh, the messages flat out in your SMTP conversation. And we're going to have uh, DMARC fail. Uh, and you can actually configure your policy uh, to set it that way. Uh, so what does DMARC alignment uh, look like? So when it aligns, that means that we're, we're, we're having success, right? Um, so in a full alignment, right, or even a partial alignment, we're going to accept that message. We're not going to reject it um, like we had in the previous example for P equals reject or P equals quarantine. So uh, obviously by themselves, uh, SPF and DCAM certainly have uh, limitations. Right. Um, maybe, you know, in, in a case where let's say you set an SPF record from your uh, initial mail store and then you had it going through your gateway uh, and have, you know, you have that connection uh, and then it actually reaches its destination. That is going to fail SPF. But that is one of the reasons um, that we could actually use DCAM and for that, you would be fine in that situation. You had DCAM signing, you had it, uh, so it was not modified in transit at all, right? Uh, this, this can be another area where you can get, can get problems, uh, but if you actually, again, when the email was created, 
you digitally signed it and you had a final check at the end, uh, everything should be aligned <clears throat> and uh, we should be good. Now, obviously, you know, on the fail, in this example, um, you know, neither the, uh, the, the, the SPF is failing and the DKIM is failing. And that is gonna make your DMARC uh, not align um, because the, the return path on that message where the mail came from um, is invalid. Right. Um, so when you, I traditionally like to think of mail just like I would uh, a real life mail or a snail mail in in an outer envelope, right? Uh, so the return path is actually what's important. And if we actually see that this message on this envelope, not not the person that it was named to, or the friendly name, or where they're claiming to be from, right? Um, if it does not match. Um, then we we are going to reject it um, if it does not pass SPF or DKIM. So even in this DKIM signature, um, I didn't necessarily get into the, the weeds. Uh, you can actually see that there are different uh, versions of the standard um, and even the relaxed, the C equal, that's the canonization, um, which means basically how closely does it align uh, when I sign this message, right? Do I care about things like spaces in my mail or, um, you know, there are certain concepts of oversigning, right? If areas are blank. Um, but uh, there is always a trade off when we're talking about security and certainly even more so in email security. There's the confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Well, uh, we certainly want to make sure our, our, our mail is deliverable as well. Um, but in this case, right, we're looking at this and uh, our, our SPF in DKIM is aligned, right? We actually, they say it's from sample.net uh, and the return path, uh, the DKIM signature, and uh, we're actually uh, good to go. And with that, uh, that's what I actually have for, for brand impersonation or stopping brand impersonation. Um, I should note out on email threat defense, we do uh, monitor over 1,500 brands right now. Um, so if you are, if, if a company is, let's say, spoofing Microsoft, let's say, or pretending to be Microsoft, um, even in uh, the message of the body, uh, we'll actually be able to trigger on that. And those would be visualizations you could see. Um, so we do have the dynamic analysis that I actually discussed. If you go into the email threat defense SaaS platform, uh, but obviously we do have the building blocks um, that are freely available out there and we have tools to help you with. Uh, hopefully you get a, an understanding of, of how SPF, DKIM and DMARC work. Uh, and with that, uh, Sergio or Tanner, do we have any questions? Yeah, got a couple here. Um, if you can answer, let's start uh, with this one. Does Cisco provide any professional service to enforce DMARC policy to reject for my domains? So um, we there are professional services available. Um, that would require a specific quote from your account manager. But that takes us to the second question, which is what is the tool offered by Cisco to receive uh, RUA and RUF reports and already using Iron Port as an email gateway? So we currently um, work with two tools. One of them is domain protection uh, and the second one is Demartian. Going back to the first question about professional services, when you buy one of these uh, solutions, either domain protection or Demartian, you will get support uh, on the configuration side of things. Uh, DMARC configuration is pretty straightforward, uh, I would say, but uh, whenever you deploy the solution, you will get some support on how to deploy it. Thanks, Sergio. Great, Sergio. Thanks for jumping in there. 
Um, right now, we don't have any further questions in the Q&A panel, but just want to remind uh, all our attendees, if you do have a quick question, uh, that Sergio or Greg, we can answer for you uh, here real quick. Uh, give a moment or two maybe for some stuff to filter in. Greg, is there anything uh, you wanted to touch on real quick uh, before we do wrap up? No, I think um, that's all I had. Um, you know, again, one of the nice things about email threat defense that I will say is it does deliver um, updates pretty regularly every couple of weeks. So we're always looking um, at new threats. Uh, you, know, you know, there are things in that product uh, that we don't necessarily, you can't search for them now, uh, but Talos does track them, right? So we can sense when an account is taken over, we'll start flagging those messages. Uh, but there, there's, from a content design analysis or the user, user experience, right, we're, we're trying to uh, figure out the best ways that we can actually show that within the product uh, and display that to use user appropriately. All right, so with that, Greg, uh, great presentation today. As always, really appreciate you uh, bringing your knowledge to the Cisco community. And Sergio, thank you for your attendance today, jumping in on a couple questions. Uh, got another one that just came in here, actually. Um, considering cost, which is preferable, domain protection or demartian? I can take that one as well. Um, it, it, it shouldn't be uh, a question of costs. Yes, so the solutions have different costs. I honestly uh, do not know how to answer which one is cheaper, which I believe it was the question, but they, they offer um, different features. So you should look into your either your own or your customer requirements and understand which one is the better fit for those requirements. And after that, um, worry or look for, for the price for the solution. But as they offer slightly different uh, feature sets for the for the DMARC, um, I, I would start looking for meeting the requirements first and the price afterwards. Yeah, great, great point there, Sergio. Thank you. That's that's a brilliantly answered uh when it when it comes down to deciding. Um, between the two. If if we do have any other questions, uh, we will keep this Q&A window open for a couple more moments. Uh, for even more tutorials, demonstrations, and future webinars, please visit the Cisco Learning Network. I'll place a link in the chat screen momentarily. Today's recording usually takes about five business days to be uploaded to the Cisco Learning Network, so please give our team some time uh, to get it together, edited down, and uploaded. Um, if, if it is not up in the next week or two, please feel free to reach out and uh, we'll coordinate as necessary. Your feedback is important to us, and at this time, you'll be directed to a post-webinar survey. Please take the time to participate in that. It helps us with future sessions. Once again, we thank everybody for joining us today, and we will see you next time on the Cisco Learning Network. Hello, and thank you for joining this live webinar presented by the Cisco Learning Network. This webinar will be recorded and made available on the Cisco Learning Network, and information on how to access the recording will be emailed to you following the live session. Please allow up to five business days for the full recording to be made available. Thank you very much and enjoy the presentation. And thank you for joining this live webinar presented by the Cisco Learning Network. This webinar will be recorded and made available on the Cisco Learning Network, and information on how to access the recording will be emailed to you following the live session. Please allow up to five business days for the full recording to be made available. Thank you very much and enjoy the presentation.